Welcome to the Turning Stone Show, where we discuss topics of the human experience. We're here to offer conversation, ask questions, and explore. I'm David Marsh, and here with me, as always, is Jesse Farrell and Justin Maman. Our topic today is Earth Impact, Environmental Awareness in Post-Industrial Society. Today's guest is Dr. Angela Bellantoni. She received her doctorate in environmental sciences with emphasis in pollution prevention and remediation. She is the president of Environmental Alternatives in Canyon City, Colorado. Recently, we had a chance to spend some time with Angela and to hear her story. Back in the 70s, ecology came out, the word, for the first time. And my sister and I used to play this game, ecology. It was just one of those paper games you make up. But it, it was a passion, you know, you felt it in your heart. And then it was in the days of the commercial with the Native American standing against the road and the trash. I would go pick up trash at the grocery store parking lot at night for fun with girlfriends. That was before there were ecology clubs and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I tried to do the recycling thing and always did the two-sided paper. And even in college, um, back in those days, you had the big printer sheets with the green and the white stripes across. And, you know, a whole bunch of them would be tossed. Well, if you go to my PCAM notes, that's what I used. I retrieved those. I mean, it was just stuff like that. And that was in the 70s. And then I found out later that, in fact, there were environmental science programs. Ended up at Rutgers University. And as I drove down the road, I had cattle dairy, chickens, sheep, and the first building that wasn't in the farming ag school, environmental sciences. And I said, yeah, I can do that every day. I think this is gonna be great. Businesses come to me and say, I would like to do this here. What do I need to do? And Environmental Alternatives is a turnkey environmental company. It's usually natural resource development and heavy industry are the two that that I have because I'm in Colorado. Minerals are big. Stop paving our planet. You're taking away God's carbon sink. That's a, that's a carbon sink. And then what is our major greenhouse gas? Carbon dioxide. You're exhaling it. You really want to get rid of carbon dioxide? You got to have plants because if we're going to have energy and every time you burn it's water and carbon dioxide, then you got to have some place for that to go and that's your greenhouse gas. Plants is God's gift for your carbon dioxide sink because they're absorbing carbon dioxide and exhaling oxygen. Reduce, reuse, recycle, but not just feel good guys, cradle to grave. When I pick up those tools for gardening, what is it wrapped in? Make sure that everything, the plastic, the paper, I'm going to put in a recycle system somehow. We can demand of our recycling industry of going even further with recycling, the process of recycling, besides just the obvious paper and plastics. Reduce, reuse, recycle, and thinking all the time, even your tennis shoes, something, cradle to grave, really. Let me go the distance. And, but every person needs to take that on, and I have to say this is a global issue. We can do this. You know, there was a time where the Ohio River burned every spring when it thawed, it was so full of pollution. It doesn't do that anymore. If we can do that with water quality, we can do it with the solid waste and natural resources of our planet. When you pick something up, think about it when you buy something. Am I going to consume it 100%? Am I really going to make sure that none of it gets in the landfill? Your trash can isn't your go-to. Pride yourself on the day your trash can's empty. If we could do that, we could change this. We could make a difference, but it's an individual. Everybody has to do it because you are a consumer. If you're a consumer, you need to think cradle to grave on everything you pick up. Angela, thank you. That was great. Tell me, how can we be aware of our environmental impact, our imprint on the earth? Um, each of us, as a member of the planet, as a, as a resident of the planet, um, we need to think about everything we consume, what we need to survive, especially in our modern world. And that includes solid waste, natural resources, and particularly energy. That's a passion. Um, you need to really stop and think about where is it coming from? What is it contributing to our environment? What are the waste products from it? 
And what am I doing about those waste products as an individual? And instead of throwing up our hands and saying, well, I can't do anything about the plastic bottle, I can't do anything about the food waste or the paper plates, you need to stop and say, is action a way if you can't physically do something about it? So just stop and really look at it. It's not just the feel goods of paper plastic metals. It's everything. It's what are we going to do with this table when we're done? What about the couch? Think about it. How long am I going to have this couch? I believe Mother Earth cried from her heart and soul the day the phrase planned obsolescence was coined. It was like a cancer that she was wondering, am I ever going to be rid of or be able to heal the impact of planned obsolescence? You know, a lot of people don't even realize that engineers create a product so it wears out. Do a little explanation for those that may be unfamiliar with planned obsolescence. Give a little description of that. When my parents got married um, back in the 50s, they bought a refrigerator. That refrigerator was used in my home all of my 26 years of my life, uh, plus then, uh, and then was moved to the cabin that my father built in New Mexico and continued to be used until about five years ago. It was a wonderful insulated ins uh, refrigerator. It served our family for decades. Since that refrigerator, we've had two. So planned mm -hmm. obsolescence is that I got to be modernized. Uh, whether and that's another thing is sometimes I have to confess the energy policies we have kick out old models for improved energy efficiency. And my question is, really? Yeah. Now what do I have to do? Yeah. And, and where do all those things end up? That's the question. Yeah. In yeah. the landfill, are they really recycled? Yeah. Um, how many end up too often in rural communities in a ravine? Yeah. Um, it's, you hope that it ends up in a landfill. I guess that's the best bad yeah. solution. Now you made a, a comment when we were talking, uh, when we filmed your piece. You talked about 30% as a number of landfill space. Put that into context. When you construct a RecreD compliant landfill, complete with liner, leachate collection, all that sort of thing, you project the life of the landfill based on the community that's going to be contributing to the landfill. Well, that's off by about 30%. We're in, we are filling landfills 30% faster than what they're designed for. Wow. So you are going to have to start building more landfills, and who's going to cough up that ground? Yeah. And, and is that going to be an embraced uh, land use adjacent to what? Where are you going to put it? Because today everybody is upset about what's next door to them. What's the solution? Are you really going to kick in, reduce, reuse, recycle, so we don't need this thing, this land use? of a rec The first thing I did as an environmental scientist um, in Colorado was help the, build uh, a regional landfill. Eye-opener. Huge eye-opener. There was nothing to do locally. You were not responsible. We trucked all that waste out of Fremont County into surrounding neighborhoods, I mean surrounding counties. That's responsible. Let's talk about transportation fees and handling fees and now we dumped our responsibility on some other community. So take responsibility. So mm -hmm. yeah, landfills are not the solution. When I bought, you know, this furniture here, that was certainly not on my consciousness whatsoever. I wasn't mindful of it at all. It was just like, okay, I need this for this set, and that was it. And there wasn't really, I don't know that I ever thought about that. So how do you, how do you work with people or educate people, or what kind of triggers do you suggest for people to start even thinking about that mindfulness and that consciousness to be aware of, even at the simplest, what well, most of us do every single day is, you know, purchase something at the grocery store or at a restaurant or have a takeout or something like that, where you have a plastic item of some sort that you almost is unavoidable. How do you start to become a mindful of every single choice that you're making throughout the day? It is an individual choice to become responsible. And, you know, I can only suggest that you think about those items as you pick them up. But it, what I would really like to see is, you know, the great big totes that you have for trash? Cut them in half. 
let's just start right there. <laughs> yeah. So that everybody says, now your weekly trash has to fit in here. Yeah. Back in um, the 90s when we were living in Tucson, Tucson had mandatory recycling. Hmm. And um, the trash truck came twice, I know, because my daughter and I sat and watched it come. And th we had to have recycles, and we had a small trash can. It was wonderful. It was a new program at the time. But it was a community that said, we we're going to have mandatory recycling, so they only collected trash once. Recyclables, the second one. So I don't even know what your community does. And frankly, it's easier for a metropolitanized area to reduce reuse recycle than it is for rural communities. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the problem is, once it's collected, now I have to transport it. And unless you have a place for storage, which is another battle, is that, all right, so I have to, I have a minimum amount that I have to have to break even on the cost of transporting the commodity to the end user who's going to recycle this, right? People get upset because you're storing it. Okay, come on, give me a break. This is an industry. Um, you don't live in the pristine forest, Yosemite National Park, that's why they're there. We don't store them in those things. We are storing them in an industrial community next to a railroad track or a warehouse and we're doing a feel-good thing. You should drive by and see those piles of commodities, mm -hmm. hopefully, that are going to be transported as soon as there's enough to, to um, be able to account for the cost on the truck into the metropolitan mm -hmm. area. So just, um, you know, just I, I, I really don't have an answer here. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I don't well, yeah, have an answer. That's perfect. <laughs> I know. That's, it's, well, it is perfect. It's and not a really show about answers. It's exactly. a show about exploring. And that's what's beautiful about and this. And it's, we'll, it's a question most likely that we'll end up leaving the audience with today is how do you become mindful every single day? So where do you go? Yeah. Where, I mean, that's the question. And, it has, and it's, a, it, it's a trigger for me. Is where do you go to get information about this? And yeah. what it do you do? It seems daunting. Well, so, but, but don't you go hit the internet? Well, there's there's a couple of concepts that we've talked about on the show, and you know there are people who come on the show and espouse um, concepts like abundance, and what we're talking about is being conservative and being mindful. So how do we live from a place of abundance, and also be mindful of conserving resources? Um, because I think the two kind of get exactly. confused sometimes. And I think because we're a consumer society, Amen. that drives us to believe that we don't really, whatever we use, we can literally dispose of it at any time. And there is no, there is no process to create something new. It's already there for us. What would happen, what would happen if each of us was told, you have X number of cubic yards of landfill space. Hmm. End of story. Right. End of story. Would you stop and realizing that that is a resource? Well, it makes me think even like how that would even begin to impact and change our diet and nutrition. Like how much would we start really looking at more of a plant-based diet and be more of a plant-based society where we were looking at other alternatives like, okay, well, if I can't put everything in plastic or what have you, then Maybe I'm going to grow things fresh. Mm -hmm. That's good. And get this goes back to that 10 mile eating radius, that yeah. sort of thing. Well, you should be probably think about doing that. Energy is a big issue. You need to energize within not 10 miles, of course. It's a bigger. I'm five. I don't go outside my five mile radius. <laughs> that's because that's where you know where the diners are. He only goes to Lucy's. Yeah. <laughs> you had a question, Dave? The Turning Stone show is about what is underneath the surface. And it's also about raising awareness to different issues. And so one thing, after I've talked with you, you spoke about single-use plastics. I went, oh, I never thought about single-use plastics. Because there's the, the Tupperware type of thing where we can use it over and over again to store something in there. But then there's the Ziploc baggie. You put it in there and you put it in the garbage. You get a new one, you put it in the garbage. The sandwich bag, you make a lunch for a kid in the morning and then it goes in the garbage. And I was thinking, well, how many of these single-use plastic pieces am I just contributing to a garbage pile? Produce bags from the grocery store. Yeah. 
Oh boy, yeah. Uh, and that's a minor modification that I've made in my life where I go get the reusable bags. I thought, well, how simple is that? Just to go get something that I can put groceries in, take them in, and then reuse them all the time. So I thought that was a very simple thing for me to do. Uh, to, you know, a water bottle that I can fill up at home and take with me through the day. Some simple things. But underneath the surface of all these issues that we have, a big one's energy. And what really struck me was your content on nuclear energy, how so many people are afraid of it because of some negative things that may or may not have happened in the world. Give me your take on what we can do with, positively with nuclear energy. It is a high density energy and that means that it's lots produced based with a small amount of the fuel. It's amazing. Research done on the protective domes for the reactors is mind-bogglingly sophisticated and understood tremendously. Um, unfortunately, it had some bad dinks, and that is that first it evolved from mystery and fear of World War II and all of that it came out of that. So rather than you say we have a beautiful thing that's being used in a negative way here was a negative thing and we're trying to evolve it to a beautiful thing so that's a hard hard thing and and not, not to say there have been some misplaced reactors i mean frankly japan was so smart they have a high density population they don't have room for wind farms they don't have room for solar energy they don't have any coal they don't have any now what did they they were smart super smart was it a good place well it's the, the whole country is on a fault line. It's going to have those things happen. Should they have maybe updated? 2020 hindsight. They didn't know the tsunami was coming. Yeah. Okay, so all right, we do have those things, but that shouldn't be what we see when we think of nuclear energy, nor should Three Mile Island. Frankly, Three Mile Island worked. Those dials told them to shut things down. Mm. The uh, impact environmentally was contained. Was there a major meltdown? Yes. Was it contained? Yes. Hmm. So stop throwing Three Mile Island to a me as a reason for shutting down nuclear energy. Um, the fuel you need is nominal compared to uh, any other fuel that you use. It's not being burned. Oh my goodness. What does that mean is not going to be produced? No carbon dioxide, yeah. right? Yeah. We all need to read the book by Gwyneth Cravens called Power to Save the World. This delightful woman was anti-nuclear. She was anti-coal. She went in with a, with a mission. But bless her heart, she did this wonderful research and she found coal plants are clean. She found solar energy is expensive. Solar energy has heavy metals in the, power, in the mm. solar plant panels. Yeah. Mm. I mean, you're not doing us any favors. Yeah. You may be... Now, I got to take that back though. Here, I got to remember where I am. Here in Arizona, your resource is solar. End of story. If we were in the Northwest, hydro is your source. Mm. Got it. So, everybody, Pennsylvania, don't take away their coal. That's their resource. Let them have it because where there is coal, there is also clean coal engineering. We have it. Mm. Let's use it. So, so where you get your information when you're trying to figure out is this a good thing or a bad thing is obviously we all go to the internet and we all Google. I want to beg everybody not to read the top article. Mm. That just means it had top advertising spot, mm. please. And the, and the other thing is don't stop at Wikipedia, even though people give Wikipedia a bad dink, but they're trying. And they all say on there, they disclaim, this is not a well-researched topic. If you have information, please send us your resources, your references, or And what's anything. nice is someone like you can go on there and update that information so that oh. way people are getting accurate information. You know what, maybe I haven't. I have to confess yeah. I haven't. But <laughs> when, I, when I read that, I go, okay, I appreciate the fact you're confessing or at least stating that I'm, this is not a well-researched. But what it does give you is places to go. Hmm. I encourage you, go. Go beyond that. So, so you're saying that on Wikipedia, it offers you places to go research and oh, look Oh, yeah, and they'll read. be hyperlinked, okay. so they'll have references yeah. list. Don't just stop there, go. Right. And, and, and the first couple that you see when you Google, please yeah. go further. It's always a good, those yeah. are always the paid advertisers. Yeah, yeah. Down. Well, but the other thing, too, is make sure the references 
mm. aren't just another tabloid. Yeah. The reality of it is that we have ecology and we have economics yep. and we live in a really fast paced world and the average person literally does not have the time, patience or energy to digest peer reviewed information and usually what people are looking for is infographics and they're using for they're looking for quick mm. information that Something they can put on their Facebook quickly page. digest <laughs> put on their Facebook page <laughs> Good and that's point. that's and you how, also are communicating to many different personality types so people are going to some people like just may enjoy reading the research sure. whereas some of myself I'm going to look at the tagline necessarily maybe you know skim what? through so it look at the image and why, then go from there I mean whereas every <clears> consumer needs to make this as a responsibility. What would happen if we turned the tide and said every manufacturer, whether you're manufacturing right. electricity, food, because there's runoff from fertilizers yeah. or whatever. And, and in a way we've started that, but too often a good point, Justin, economics and ecology, economics and environment. And that's part of what Environmental Alternatives does is we have to ha find that perfect marriage between what is environmental stewardship and still makes economic sense for that company to make that. Yeah. And and each person who is in manufacturing evaluates that in a feasibility study, hopefully. Yeah. And hopefully you can trust then that if you buy energy, they are being held accountable for any sort of environmental impact. Yeah. How do or you what know? any man you said hopefully. It's like that's where I'm always like, like how do you know? You know, I don't know. Do I? I really, I mean, you, you really you really don't know. I mean, you could, oh. Well, there's something that you told me yeah. when we were talking. You said you need to trust that the government agencies oh. that are in place are doing their job because yeah. they're regulated, extra regulated, documentation. You said it's actually a good system that we've put in place because of legalities and litigation. Talk to and when I would hear that, I would be like, well, the first thing that comes up is nobody wants to trust the government. <laughs> exactly. So I'm very curious as to what you're going to say. Yeah, yes, and, and, and you have to understand that, that I, um, I'm on this side of the table of government. Uh, my, my job, environmental um, alternatives, is to put my clients at ease in that we're going to work with these regulators. I, it's a hard sell, but they are your friend. We are going to coexist. We're going to end up sending Christmas cards when we're done. Um, <laughs> but I do. Uh, we have many tiers of environmental uh, regulations, federal, state, sometimes even local counties. And we have an interesting thing in the United States. So many people say, oh, the EPA. Well, because of our 50 states, our, our states gets, gets to choose. Each state chooses whether to be an agreement state or not. Mm. And that means that you have agreed to enforce EPA regulations at EPA level on behalf of EPA or stricter. Each state decides that. I know Colorado really, really well, and Colorado is an agreement state, and they are stricter, more strict than the federal regulations. And we have oversight. Each agency, for example, our EPA, hands and feet in Colorado, is called Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. And inside that department, we have Division of Water, Air Quality, Hazardous Waste, Radioactive Materials. It's all right there. And uh, US EPA will come in as an oversight. They periodically do evaluations to make sure they're being accountable. So that's your state level. Yeah. And then you have your local county levels. Now they're not supposed to be, there's not, you can't have double oversight over the same mm -hmm. aspect. But so what they do to the local governments is give them control of land use. Mm. So where would you, how can you do this traffic? neighborhoods, buffers. Does, what, what's coming up for me is, you know, because as Dave said, so we're, we like to try to get underneath the surface. And um, I remember the very first part of your video, you were talking about how um, you were in the 70s and the term ecology came out and it touched your heart. So we're talking about what people should do. But the bigger question is how do we get people to care? So the, you know, I think the biggest disconnect is that we buy product, this is our system, we buy a product, we take the wrapper off, we put it in the trash, we take the trash to the curb, we never see it again. How do we connect the importance? And obviously people need um, consequences to know 
right? That just like almost just like we're uh, ra- we're raising a society, right? We're raising a society to teach them their impact on themselves and each other. And I would say, how do we connect and become mindful? Like what you were talking about right. at the beginning, how to become mindful of all. Because I'm, I'm seeing this become... as an, I'm seeing this as an individual. I don't, I don't I don't. It's all about education, of course, but it's all also making it real. So right. What what are you, what? But how do we get people to care? That's so. A so bit what I'm Justin's saying is asking. so. Like, it's, how do we get people so to it's care? It's individual. It's individual, and because we're an individualist society, it is individual. We have individual responsibility for our choices and actions. Unfortunately, I don't have an answer you know because what? it's personal. And, yeah. Yeah. It is personal. As he was saying that, what I was thinking for you even is you would talk about education. And it even, you know, like we sometimes will say, okay, kids, we're going to go volunteer at a homeless shelter because it gives them the experience of what it's actually like. Maybe they should homeless. go, so go volunteer at a landfill. A yeah, yeah, yeah. A landfill. Like go actually see this is what happens. And here's the impact of what happens. It's yeah. like you got to see it face to face. You know, I, I agree. More consciously. I go, if go to the ocean or go to the You like know what else? Here's another one. It. When I was studying landfills and solid waste, uh, one of the giggles that we would have in class go, if it smells under your sink, it smells in your trash can, guess what? It smells in the landfill. How are we so ready to just push these uglinesses hmm. out of us and onto somebody else? What did Fremont County all those years? Took all of that trash out, not somebody else. You're right. I don't have it. It is an individual thing. It is a culture thing. How do you break the culture? Well, you know what? I don't have a. Uh, yeah. I don't have a gold star easy button. Well, you think yeah. about yeah. it. I, mean, I what, don't have I mean, it. I've never even had the thought, or and I've never even heard somebody else have the thought. It's like, oh, kids, we're gonna go spend a day at the landfill, so you actually get an experience of what it's like. This mm-hmm. is what happens to your trash. You would think about doing that with homeless people. Yeah, but why would we not think and about doing that with our earth, or going about, down to the river and picking up? We're going to, out to the lake and picking up all the trash see, around the lake. See, my son and I went fishing. I did the pull, fishing pull backwards, and all we did was take trash out of yeah, the lake. It's <laughs> crazy. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. yeah, I a couple yeah. of years ago I went uh, whitewater rafting in Oregon on the Desch- on the Deschutes River. And what was so amazing about that river is it is pristine, and you have a heavy, heavy fine for any waste that actually gets thrown into the river. And it's a clean river, it was amazing. Yeah, I'm a scuba diver and it's amazing when you look uh, what's underneath the surface, all of the trash that people in a boat drop and they don't even think about. And then we as scuba divers, we see it. And if it's something that we can pick up and put in our BCD, Hmm. we will. Uh, It is interesting though, if it's a house for somebody, if it's a little hermit crab Hmm. living in that, plastic bottle, that's now part of the environment, so we don't touch that. Hmm. We're very into conservation as a diver. Absolutely. How wonderful. I have. Yeah, we just each have to do the, the little bitty pieces, but it also has to be from the producers, not just the consumers. Yeah. But the other thing that keeps coming to mind as you're speaking is be aware that this is not an infinite globe, an infinite world, an yeah. infinite source mm-hmm. of, uh, right. of natural resources. This is not infinite. And too often, when I'm seeing subdivisions crawl, you know, expand, urban sprawl, this sort of thing, I'm going, land, it's finite. Your ground is finite. Let's figure out right now. I would love some scientist to put to paper, calculate, based on history, how much waste each person generates in a 60-year life. Let's just go to 60-year life, okay? And then quantify that. Kind of like we do plastic bottles, we ring the earth 10 times end to end, Mm. you know, one day's worth of plastic bottles, you know what, some number like that. Wouldn't you love to see that number? Because wouldn't you love to see how much of our planet's left? Have we just filled the ocean? Wow. Let's, let's, I want want somebody to do that number for me. The infographics are really what get people because that gives gives people um, some context for their role in it. Because if you show people on a day-to-day basis, we're not aware of how we contribute and how we impact this problem. But when we get to see on a wide scale, like over the course of day after day after day, what that impact is, all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, something connects. It's got to connect with the heart and there's got to be data that gets people alarmed about their impact. Well, you know, I was just thinking as your wonderful home, what would happen if you weren't allowed to take off your site any of your trash, 
Hmm. Would you have enough space to store all your trash? So great. What would you do? Yeah, right. If you were responsible for that, I, I live on Main Street in Canyon City, Colorado. I have a very small yard as well, and I'm thinking you're going. We would have a big problem, yeah. a really big problem. And it's really, I mean, when I started recycling, the only thing we put in the trash is food waste, and that can and, be composted. And that can be composted. So, really, when I take out my recycle and my trash each week, my dumpster my trash dumpster is like filled till there and my recycle dumpster is always Wonderful. overflowing and it's not really a difficult it's not really a difficult thing it doesn't really take any much more time it literally takes awareness and that is the key i think that most people are just simply unaware yeah. and let's go to food waste uh, i was about to ask is that like what's coming next as far as the yeah. recycle process you got trash recycle well, there's composting. composting well yeah. but let's go to food waste and, we, and you have to be very careful there because that's an aerobic system supposed to be. It can go anaerobic, which is smelly, but you can fix that. Just don't give up just because it does. Meat waste mm. is the tough one. Mm. All right, so really, if meat waste was all you had in your dumpster, it'd be even less. But the other part that gets really tough is paper with food waste on it is not recyclable. Mm. Right. So your pizza boxes and your paper oh, towels right. and your takeout containers those are not recyclable if it's paper as soon as it's food soiled so what do we do and I was you know you guys are making me think about this and I'm going so what do I do do I take a Tupperware dish do I take a plastic dish to in and out burger and say put it in here <laughs> well, can you imagine earlier, that McDonald's don't wrap yeah, that yeah. put totally. it here well yeah. what if you went to the grocery store and I was thinking about that as you were talking about that earlier it's like okay I actually saw a picture of myself now going to the grocery store and having my own basket or whatever inside of my cart, putting all my produce on there, and then having whatever is going to be measured on the scale, and then putting each produce in there. So the measurement of the whatever I'm measuring in or weighing in is always the you same. You have to tear everything. And then, yeah, I, I thought about that too. Yesterday we were at the grocery store and we're buying that wonderful granola, and I'm going, how do we do this without those yeah. plastic bags? Yeah. Yes. And I, I, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna look at actually. Practicing that this week when we get because we buy a lot of produce, we go through a lot of those bags, and um, I'm just wondering like what would that be like? And and also, you got to think about it, it. It starts with one person at a time. So you think about everyone who's also at the store observing. What are you doing? You know what my and it father. Starts a conversation. My father raised three daughters during the '60s, and he used to tell us, "Set the trends, don't mm, follow it." Now that was just awesome. a, a Midwestern farmer saying, "I can't afford." buy the latest fashion. Yeah, that's good. Okay, but seriously. That's good advice. Set the I trend. Have, I have, I want to kind of shift the conversation slightly. So you talked about, we've talked about several, several things, and then I want to bring it back to maybe a way to begin to personalize it that we've talked about, and also to look at the impact of heavy metals, which we've talked about, the impact of plastics. There is a, the, another impact of that that's not just global, there's also the health impact of that. Uh, yeah. Can you talk? I mean, because I. I'm not a health scientist. Okay. I really, I really can't. Yeah. I can only do that, you know, those are petroleum derivatives. Mm, yeah. And if we have to conserve petroleum and want to control that, then use less. Those are petroleum derivatives. Yeah. I would just look at, I know that there is, there is a major impact on the body on heavy metals and taking metals in. So every single soda that you drink out of a can or every single beer that you drink out of a can or anything that you store in plastic or microwave in plastic, God forbid, or buy in plastic, it's been stored in plastic. And so there is also that impact of having those plastics in your body. And so I always look at as much as possible using glass, drinking out of a jar, storing things in glass um, as, as much as possible, always having things in glass to reduce that impact that it has also on my body. And so that's been a way of, for my own personal way. In of, defense of the plastic industry though, can I go just yeah, there? Yeah. Because I mean, I lived through that and we've moved back to, that's kind of funny, you know, you were in glass forever and then you moved into plastic. And to control the temperature mm. in a glass takes more energy than plastic. Mm, interesting. And so what your refrigerators, your convenience stores preferred the plastic because it got cold faster, but once it came out, it also got hot faster. So glass takes longer to cool, and so they spend more energy at the store keeping it cold, but once it comes out, it stays cold longer. 
So it's an offset. You make and a what choice. Next, what do you, what do, you do? Cool, and it was a new cool long enough. And I know like keeping your refrigerator full is often better times than yes. having it empty because it's going to be, it's going to yes. use less to try and cool it. So, uh, and the, what the, the part of the point to that for me was, it was my own imprint that I'm leaving on the planet Choices. is yeah. being responsible for, okay, I'm going to reuse the same glass bottle every yeah. day for drinking. I'm not going to go buy a plastic bottle for drinking. How many plastic bottles, how many, how much water does it actually take to create the plastic bottle that there you're you drinking go. out of? Yeah. That's and when two. you start really thinking about it at that, breaking it down, I mean, there's so many great documentaries that talk about the impact of those types of topics. And it's just, I mean, it's worth watching. It's worth doing the information on that for your own health. And that I think becomes where you really start thinking about it for yourself, where it then becomes a global thing. And there's nothing against the industries. Let's just make that statement. Our world is commercial and we need jobs. Yeah. And we do have a wonderful life, especially in the United States and many nations around the world. And these things can be done and they're doing it in a conscientious manner and an environmentally protective manner. So we can go down that path, but you as the consumer get to decide, do I want to deal with the byproduct of a plastic versus the byproduct of a glass? Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely fine. Yeah. Let's not get on a bandwagon to shut down glass just because we're pro or vice versa. I guess that that's also as someone in my position with environmental alternatives, um, it, it hurts when someone just decides I'm going to read the top article and get ticked and shut you down. Yeah. And you know, I have to say I've been on way too many of the receiving end of those trying to educate them past that, not seeing that in fact, listen, you're not listening to all of the dust mitigation and surface water mitigation and uh, just waste mitigation that you're going and the fact that this product is so important to your life it's kind of like i do a lot of mining a lot of mining and especially a lot of gravel mining but do you know the trouble these poor operators have to even permit a new one you yeah. don't see it very often yeah. anymore yeah. so guys you better start planning on driving on dirt and you better build mud huts and i'm not talking brick huts I'm talking mud huts, mm. and you better stop counting on that toilet in your in your bathroom, because that's it too. No, yeah. I thought that was great when you said people go out and protest a mine, and then they go home and use their toilet that's made out of porcelain <laughs> or their sink that's made out of porcelain. I know you're going. Yeah. yeah. Really? Well, that's yeah. just because, and that's and and that was to the larger question is because people follow trends, right? You said that yeah. your dad told you to be a trendsetter, and people follow <laughs> trends, right? <laughs> And it's, but it's so true, like people will rhetorically regurgitate whatever they hear that is part of the, like, that is part of the popular conversation. There you go, popular so, conversation. And, and so the, the question that I, that I had, and this is the question with any movement, like with any social movement, is how do you take this uh, relatively fringe view and how do you popularize it? First of all, you're brave enough to be on the fringe. You don't get sucked into the mainstream. And you just let them for a while think you're crazy. And then you, <laughs> I'm serious. I, I, I have an example. All right. I built a building. I did infilling in the, at Environmental Alternatives in Canyon City. And I was aware of surface water and drainage and percolation, filtration of our surface water and recharge and all that sort of thing. And of course, the city code required me to have paved parking. Right. I knew that there were other products that would serve mm. as a stabilized parking lot. I had to beg, go before city council. I had at least three meetings, two public hearings for me to put in environmentally responsible, permeable parking lot surface. It's beautiful. Yes, does it, it is crushed granite in a stabilized honeycomb made out of recycled plastic. Underneath mm. is constructed a, a compact road base so that when the water infiltrates from the top, it actually has time to go through some cleaning, if there is anything, before it's discharged into the storm drain. Do you know what I had to do to get that? That's and do awesome. you know how many people 
laugh at me and they say, oh, it's awesome. Just it's so pave it. What are some of the trends that you've been setting since your father instilled that lesson into you? I spent the money and did solar panels on my roof because I believe that's where solar panels need to be. Mm. So I am one of the only buildings on Main Street in Canyon City and I had solar panels and I had to get permission from city council. Why is that? Oh, wow. So awesome. whenever I can, yes. Set trends. Set trends. Awesome. Uh, what I've learned from you is that education is important. We all have a personal responsibility to reduce, reuse, recycle. I appreciate all of your uh, context, everything you brought to our conversation today. And uh, I think it's important for us just to have that greater awareness of the responsibility we do have on Earth Impact. Thank you. Thank you yeah, for thank having you. me. Thank awesome. you for asking me. Now's the time in the show when we have a turning stone, something to set our intention for the week. And with today's turning stone, we go to Jesse. The question to practice this week is what does your soul desire to experience in this moment and this moment and this moment of time that would have it be fulfilled? And so this week we've had an awesome conversation with Dr. Angela just talking about the different um, ways to be mindful of those minute choices and how they make a global impact. So we're going to give you three assignments this week. We're going to step it up, step it up a little bit. Number one, pull your trash can out from underneath the sink if that's where you store, or maybe you store it in the closet. Pull it out of the closet. Put it where it's out there in sight, where you can see it, where you can smell it, and you're aware of everything that's going inside of it. Number two, look at this week when you look at doing research on uh, an item that you're purchasing. Consider what the story of that item is going to be from cradle to grave. So from the time you purchase it until the time it's no longer in your presence or no longer available. And number three, when you look at doing research on anything in the future or even this week, and you go to Google or any of your research uh, websites, look beyond just your first two or three. Maybe even consider going to Wikipedia. Go beneath the surface. Look at the research that's done on that particular product. Maybe consider going to the manufacturer's website and looking directly there and see what kind of, uh, how are they being responsible for what they're manufacturing and what they're producing. So that's your Turning Stone uh, homework for the week. And remember, this is a show about questions and questioning. It is not a show about answers. Nothing we say here is the truth. It is up to each of us to discover our own truth. Join us each week on The Turning Stone Show as we continue the journey of conversations. Subscribe and get in touch with us. Stay connected and join in the conversation.